and that is before the uh, before the. Will your anger hold in the storms of life when the clouds unfold their wings of strife? When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, will your anger break or firm remain? We have anger that keeps the soul steadfast and sure.
Our God and Father, we're thankful to you that you have sent the word to us. That that which represents you, that which represents all in total knowledge, that you are the great creator, that you love us enough to send your son to take on our sins, to take our place, and to pay, pay our debt that we know we cannot pay. As we share in this, that represents our Lord's body that He freely gave. We're humbled before the cross, knowing that the ugliness of sin caused that. And Father, we thank You that through that cross, and through the work of Jesus, we stand before You as Your children. That You have not only forgiven our sins, but You have forgotten our sins. That You do not hold them against us that we stand again as your children. Father, I pray that you be with each one gathered here this morning, that as we share in this symbol of his body, that we take heed of what you have done for us and what it means to our lives. In Christ we pray. as 
his life passed from him, it gave us life. As our restlessness, he replaced that with his peace. And Father, in all this, we find joy. Joy in knowing that we have such a loving God. Knowing that you could just have easily destroyed us and started again. But instead you chose a different route. You give us this opportunity to accept you as our Lord. Accept Jesus as our Savior. And Father, help us to gather strength from his words. To apply these words not only to our lives but to our hearts. Father, we admit before you that we are weak. We pray for your strength. We admit that we sin. We pray for your forgiveness. And Father, we're so grateful to you that you have granted us eternal life. That we needn't worry about what happens after this life. Knowing that we will spend eternity in your kingdom. Oh, how glorious that will be. We thank you for the comfort we have in knowing this. And Father, I pray that you bless each one as they partake of this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
kind of just thought of this here just a minute ago. It might be kind of out of line, but um, you know, we're sitting singing these songs, and, and the, some of the little kids are trying to sing. And Lucas, you know, he's he don't know the words, but he's trying to say some things. And I said, and he said, Pap, I don't know the words. So what I'd like to do, and I don't know, maybe we can start doing a thing, but uh, right now, if we can all sing, I'd like to sing a, a children's song. And so the parents and grandparents have really kept the kids now. Have them pay attention. We're going to sing one of their songs today, those words. And maybe we'll, I'd like to do one, do one maybe for the last song of the night. We'll bring them in. So they can partake in the service. I'm not a singer. So I'm going to step away from it. <laughs> and so, boys, listen up. Okay, we're going to sing. And I, I need some help. So, uh, Jesus loves the little children. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Let's all stand. Because I will be reading Proverbs three one through eight. My son, do not forget my teachings, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will find you will favor and a good name in the sight of God and men. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, uh, Grandpa, what a good idea that was. And uh, how blessed we are that we need to even think about doing that. It's a wonderful thing. Friday, I wanted to thank you too for your prayer uh, earlier, and Vic for your prayers around the table. Well, uh, let's see. We've enjoyed having uh, Ryan and uh, Josh home with us from college for a little bit, but I think they both head back to school today. Uh, Josh back to Kent State main campus, and uh, Riley goes to Worcester, or they will be taking her later today. Hope you guys have a good new uh, semester, and uh, don't forget why you're there. <laughs> I know it's multifaceted, but you are there to study. Charlie and Chris Wildman are expecting a new little one, in case you've not noticed. <laughs> uh, and it should, the babe should be with us uh, maybe by the end of this month. Uh, so please keep them in your prayers. I think it's already been circulated that they're expecting another boy. I tell you what, this Salem is going to be a tough little girl. <laughs> she better be not to uh, deal with those uh, the little boys that will be around her life. We've all heard of the word autonomy. It's been used uh, quite a bit lately. Engineers have introduced autonomous vehicles. In fact, I think I heard on the news that Senator Rob Portman was uh, supposed to be in Youngstown one day last week to take a ride, I think, on an autonomous WRTA bus. I didn't know we were that advanced in our area here, but I guess we're coming right along. And of course, we all know that uh, Cars and trucks and drones and spacecraft and all kind of things, uh, high-tech planes uh, without pilots being uh, directed by AI or uh, somebody on the ground with, with uh, the instrumentation to guide them, GPS, etc. Some government entities uh, seem bent on uh, defying the Constitution as they fight for autonomy whether it might be over being a sanctuary state or a sanctuary city. From the days of our nation's early beginnings, 
we as Americans have always held this word close to our hearts, this word autonomy. Our, our country, our, the very fabric of our nation was born with the argument that we didn't need King George telling us how to run our business. The word autonomy has its roots. Uh, it is a compound Greek word, very simply made up of the word auto, which is the Greek word for self, and the, the, another word nomos, which is a Greek word for law. So the word is often translated, autonomy is translated as meaning self-governing or self-directing. Self-care is a big industry, and it's a good thing. Educators are highly trained in instructing us how to live independently as America grays and gets older. Therapists work diligently to help us when we run into problems to rehab and to regain control, perhaps after a stroke, so that we can go home and do for ourselves. And surely we're all aware of the numerous exhortations in Scripture to cultivate self-control and self-discipline. After all, is that not one of the fruit of the Spirit? Mentioned by Paul in Galatians 5.23, and is it not one of the Christian virtues enumerated by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6? So, from many vantage points, autonomy is a, a noble goal. It's a good achievement from many vantage points. The ultimate goal of parenting, I know it, it's uh, hard to imagine when they're so young, you with little ones, but the ultimate goal is, uh, first of all, you give them roots and then, then you uh, teach your young ones as they grow older to be autonomous. And we call that uh, giving them wings. You know, maybe as much as you hate it, uh, that one day that little one is going to have to go out on its own, his or her own. And that's what the parenting is all about, is teaching the little ones to one day become autonomous. For, for those of us who are Christians, and that would be most of us who are gathered here this morning, the rub, the rub in all of this discussion about autonomy comes when we lay two concepts uh, side by side with each other. Two words define our struggle. One is a, a word that we find often in the New Testament, kyriotis, which is the word for lordship. Jesus is Lord. He, he is kyrios. Not cheerios, but kyrios. And the other word then is, is the word uh, autonomia, which is this word living by our own rules or by our own substance or source. It's this tension, or what I'm calling a rub, that I, I want to speak about this morning. If we're, if we're not careful, we can become hoodwinked by our culture, bombarded at times, and misguided by this seemingly good concept of autonomy. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 3. Here we read the account of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Satan appears on the scene in the form of a serpent and poses a temptation and as a result, man's subsequent fall. All, all of this is, is encapsulated in the dialogue that we encounter in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Follow along as I read. 
Now, now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said to you, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it, nor touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall surely not die. For God, God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing evil from good, or good from evil. We all know how this exchange ended. Adam and Eve succumbed, or we maybe should correctly say, and I don't mean to be prejudiced in saying it this way, Eve and Adam succumbed uh, to Satan's temptation and were cast out of the garden. Fast forward to Genesis 3, verses 23 through 24, we read about that. So this sort of autonomy, it was not only the original sin, Adam and Eve yielding to Satan's temptation to be self-guided or self-directed or self-governing, to be like God himself. This autonomy was not only the original sin, but it's the ongoing sin of our world. Man's rebellion against God and his refusal to allow God to be God, that is precisely the fundamental problem of our world and our universe. The, the very problem that Jesus came to remedy. So this topic that we're tackling this morning feeds directly into our sermon series uh, on joy riders. As we discussed last Sunday, <coughs> sin is the biggest of all joy robbers, more so even than people who can really frustrate us sometimes in circumstances and our trends or tendencies towards being more rewards or even more than possessions. And furthermore, it's not, it's not a stretch to say that the sin of autonomy is the biggest and worst of them all. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. If you had to lay all sins out and say which, which one is the worst, uh, we might study that and say, well, this one is at the root of all, this sin of autonomy. So we might rightly re refer to the sin of autonomy as the, the mother of all sins. Everything seems to stream forth from that. And it really is impossible to measure or quantify the heartache and the discontent, we could say the fleecing of joy, that has been brought on by our autonomous ventures. If you want to ruin your life, there's no better way to, than to work from the premise that, that the premise that you know what's best for yourself. You really want to make a mess of your life, work from that premise. That you know what's best for your own life. The Old Testament book of Judges ends in Judges 21 and 25. It's very sad words. Here's what it says. In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. What a world that must have been. What a world that turned upside down that must have been. I've, I've stored up in my heart, in my mind, and I hope you have too, many passages of Scripture that are so uh, foundational to this lesson that we're talking about this morning. And one of the best gifts that you can give your children is to 
and grandchildren is to have them memorize these verses at a very young age. We have all kind of modern translations that make some of these older words a little easier to pronounce. And some of the verses that I'm going to share with you might be a little extensive or long for uh, one child to memorize all, all the verses like all, what was it, Fred read from Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. That's a great section of scripture. Maybe you just choose a few verses from that. It reminded me of Paul's writing to Timothy and saying in 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 and 16, Paul was saying to Timothy, from childhood, you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely furnished. I'll borrow there a, a, a couple of words that my translation says that the man of God may be adequate. But that doesn't quite get it with me. I don't like that. That seems like adequate is just not. The, the concept is furnished for every good thing. Equipped for every good work is the way it ends. So do I argue with my NIV, in the New American Standard Version, that's one passage where I don't think the word adequate is adequate. Needs a little bit uh, more powerful points to it. So I'm going to share with you uh, what I might call some AAA passages. You with little ones and you grandparents, scribble these down. I'm not going to be offended if you choose to go elsewhere in terms of selecting other scriptures, but these are, uh, I'm giving them a AAA rating because they are ancient words. I did ask Nick to leave that song this morning. They're ancient and they're anti-autonomy passages. They're ancient anti-autonomy citations. When we read these, and even more than that, when we memorize these and store them up in our hearts and minds, they keep helping us to uh, deal with this concept that we can do it on our own. They, they remind us that we can. So let's start with the first one, and it's Proverbs 14 and verse 12. Even, you, you will be surprised how the littlest of children, even before they can actually start talking, they're talking, we just don't quite know what they're saying, but they seem to be able to begin memorizing. There, there is a Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way which seems right to a man but it, its end is the way of death. That's a foundational verse on this very thing. Here's one from what Fred shared with us. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will bring healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. In other words, if you want to find joy, this is the way to do it. Trust in the Lord. Don't lean on yourself. Psalm 37, verses 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8. We've only got uh, three more. Minutes. Joshua 1 and verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate on it, on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Jeremiah 10, 
verse 27. Maybe a lot of you might have thought of this uh, at the very moment that we announced the subject of autonomy. Jeremiah 10 and verse 23. I know, O Lord, that a man's way is not in himself, nor, it, nor is it in man who walks to direct his own steps. From the New Testament, John 15 and verse 5. Jesus was a, a master teacher and he, uh, he shares these words of uh, very colorful. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. That's a big distinction there. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. And then Jesus added, for apart from me, you can do nothing. He's the vine. We're the branches. If we're not deeply connected to him, we can't do much at all. Nothing, Jesus says. So these sacred writings, along with a host of others, can serve as a balance against the, the very best education. Now you heard me right, I did say against education, and you know, and I'll make it clear again, education is a wonderful tool. I wish I had a whole lot more of it. Maybe some of you would say amen to that. Not only that you wish I had more, but that you wish you had more. But any education, any education that is not anchored with scriptures like these, uh, the ones that we've mentioned here just in the last few minutes, it, it'll prove counterproductive. We've all met well-educated youths and adults who have ended up being too smart for their own good. It's a sad path to follow or to travel. Uh, most of the time you don't even realize what's happening. Others around you begin to see it maybe before you do. Through the Old Testament prophet, again, ancient words, the, the Lord addresses this very idea in Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Now, one of the memory verses was Jeremiah 10, 23, but we're going to back up a chapter to 9, 23 and 24. And here's what the text says. Thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not a mighty man boast of his might. Let not a rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness and justice and righteousness on earth. For I delight in these things. So if you're going to boast, you boast, I know the Lord. I know Him, and He is God, the Lord. In ancient times, Babylon, well, I could say it was a great city, and I don't mean that to give approval. It was a big city. It was a bustling city. It was a, a city that attracted the fear and the uh, applaud of people all around. It, uh, it was a city filled with good and bad. And it came to be known as a city that was one of the number one enemies of the children of Israel, of God's people. And the history of Babylon all began way back in Genesis chapter 11 with that Tower of Babel. Genesis 11, 4 sounds a little bit innocent on the surface, but when you dig in, you can see that it's, it's the beginning of this concept of autonomy. Come, let us build for ourselves a city, the verse says, and let us build a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. For uh, then it adds, and let us make a name for ourselves. 
Now, the Tower of Babel would have been a wonderful city set on a hill <coughs> with lights shining from the very highest spot if their whole concept was, let's do this so that people can see the glory of God. But the real key here shows you that their aim was, let us make a name for ourselves. And they did. Years ago, uh, Jeannie and I heard Nathan Cope say to his younger sister, Kristen, as older brothers might be inclined to say to younger sisters or vice versa, he said when he got exasperated one day at something she did, he said, Kristen, the world does not survive around you. He meant revolve, but that uh, escaped him at the moment. He quoted it the best way he remembered it. And it's pretty colorful, isn't it? But Kristen, the world does not survive around you. Even though God thwarted Babylon's early goals, he stepped down and conflicted their language, confused them in their quest to build this great tower. <clears throat> Nevertheless, a reconstituted Babylon kind of rose from the ashes and came again. Babylon continued to be fixated on this concept or idea of autonomy. So God sent another prophet, this time the name was not Jeremiah, but it was Isaiah, to deliver a final verdict to that ancient Babylon. I know there's still cities that claim that name today, but we're talking about this ancient city. The commentator and one of our brethren, Homer Haley, in his commentary on Isaiah says, the Babylon of Chaldea characterized the same spirit as what we read in Genesis 11 and verse 4. And the spirit of Babylon of Chaldea symbolized the, the cruelty and the haughtiness of man without God. The pride of man when he is left to his own devices. So in Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah dealt with the arrogance and the boast and the fall of the Babylonian king. You can read about that in chapter 14. In chapter 46, God further speaks uh, a woe upon Babylon in that he reveals his judgment against all of the idols, the so-called idols of Babylon. That's in chapter 46. And I, I mentioned those really leading up to this uh, pinnacle point here, and it's from Isaiah 47. This is the text where I got the title of my sermon from. Je uh, Isaiah 47, verses 1 and following. Here we find God speaking to the queen of Babylon. Seems to take on an extra song, strong sense, and maybe she was kind of like a, a Jezebel in those days, and that she ruled the roost. He tells this once regaled queen that she is soon to be like a slave girl. You can imagine the queen of Babylon being on the receiving end of this prophetic utterance. In verse 5, the text says, Sit silently and go into the darkness. O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you will no longer, no more be called the queen of, king, of kingdoms. And then verses 7 through 10. Yet you said, I shall be a queen forever. These things you did not consider, nor remember the outcome of them. Now then, hear this you sensual one who dwells securely, who says in your heart, I am, and there is no one like me, or no one beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, no, nor shall I know the loss of children, because these two things shall come upon you suddenly in one day, loss of children and widowhood. And then listen to the culmination verse. They shall come upon
upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries, in spite of your great power and your great spells. And you felt secure in your wickedness and you said, no one sees me. That's another way of saying I don't have to account to anybody for what I do. No one sees me. And then Isaiah says, your wisdom and your knowledge, they have deluded you. For you have said in your heart, I, I am, and there is no one like me. I am, and there is no one beside me on a level with me. We can mark this down. Put this down in your little note box. No one says I am to the great I am and gets away with it. That's simple, but that's profound. No one says I am, I am, to the great I am and gets away with it. As we mentioned last Sunday, you say that and you can write down, be sure your sin will find you out. In and of ourselves, we are not all that. Most of us in our growing up years have been told that. Sometimes you get to thinking you're really special and your parents or your siblings or somebody will remind you you're not all that. You're not, you're not all that you think you are. <clears throat> the only thing that really makes us special and exceptional is that we are a people for God's own possession. That's, that's where our uh, uniqueness lies. That's from 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us, we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. In another one of his letters or epistles, Paul says very strongly in Romans 12 and verse 3, through the grace, through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, you can probably finish it, can't you? Not to think more highly of yourselves than you want to think. The sinner we realize this, the better off we'll be. Let, let me close with a brief postscript. And you can say, well, this really is at the heart of this sermon this morning. I could have left this off. I, I told you last Sunday I'd be shorter today. And I'm, I'm doing okay on it. I don't know. We, I think we sang an extra song. But, <laughs> but I'm about to wrap here. So just... Get a hold of yourself, we're almost done. I, I am a man of my word. Uh, here's the postscript. Maybe I could have left this off, but I, 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 I got to get this off my chest. In our fellowship, we're often, we are often quick to point out that we, churches of Christ, we are, can you finish it? We are autonomous. We're, we're an autonomous group. That's, that's our claim. I've taught this and will continue to, but I want to I want to qualify it a little bit better. But but I must, I have to admit that uh, the older I get, the more I cringe at this point. But to think of the sermon that I'm giving today and then think of if you go to our website the first thing you might read is that we are an autonomous bunch. Was Terry Ryder is the website right? Our website doesn't address that, but I'm just asking you to imagine. Many of our congregations emphasize this on their website. They're real keen on it. They want to point out that we're in, in the context the term is simply meant to say that we don't have any headquarters. That we're just trying to be like the church of the New Testament. Just simple Christians 
no headquarters anywhere where anybody's barking out orders, dictating doctrine, or giving edicts to all of the churches. That's all we mean when we say we're autonomous, but the, the truth is, we are not autonomous. We never have been and we never should be. All of us are under God's leadership. And that's my point in this sermon. Colossians 1 and verse 18, Christ is the head of the body. He has first place in everything. I didn't make that up, that's in the text. Colossians 2 and verse 11, Christ is the head over all rule and authority. Don't tell me we're autonomous. We aren't. We're, we're under Christ the Lord. We're the clay. He's the potter. We're clay in the hands of the potter. We have a name who, for children who think, I don't know what, uh, how would you define, uh, what qualifies a child to be thought of as a rat? Anybody want to share on that? Gail, what do you say? Undisciplined? Yeah, I think of that one too when I think of this. Uh, maybe there's quite a few uh, related things that uh, we could say that makes a brat a brat. But when we, we have a name for these children who seem to be behaving like they're, they're in charge is the way I would say it. And uh, I was surprised at the etymology of that word brat. I, I went to the dictionary and said, where, where does that word come from, brat? Why do we call them brats? And the dictionary says that it had to do with the clothing that the little, little ones wore back in those days. That the cloth was referred to as a kind of brat. Coarse garments. Uh, I don't know what they wore exactly in years gone by. But the, the best way to avoid being viewed as a brat or thought of as a brat in the eyes of God then is to clothe ourselves with humility. We must be humble in heart towards others, but especially and most importantly, we must be humble in heart towards God. We all have family and friends Sad, it's so sad that we have to make this commentary. It seems like we all have family and friends who have come to view themselves as being atheist or agnostic, or maybe they never say those two words, but in all practice, that's what they are by their behavior. They either don't believe in God or they just don't believe that there's enough evidence to say yeah, your name. They claim, some of them do, to have studied themselves out of believing in God. My wife is quick to point out that in most, if not all, of these decisions uh, come about from a moral basis and not always an intellectual basis. And while we continue to love family and friends, even those who have made that kind of a declaration, we, we cannot eradicate God's words on their declaration. Here's the passage. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's found uh, two times in the Psalms. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. We're not calling him a fool. God's calling him a fool. And I close with the words today from the 100th Psalm. Psalm 100 and verse 3. Know that the Lord Himself is God. It is He who made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and we are the sheep of His passion. 
we could elaborate a lot on that sheep idea. We'll save that for another day. Would you bow in prayer with me? Father, we come before you today at the beginning of this new year to think about this important concept that we've studied about this morning that you're God, we are not. You're the Lord, we are not. That we look to you for guidance in all that we do. And Father, we're praying that we can be that very kind of people. Help us not to desire to be autonomous, especially in things spiritual and things moral, but to always look to you, knowing that it, it is not in ourselves to direct our own paths, but we look to you. And Father, as we look to you, then help us, guide us, direct us, use whatever means you might choose others around us to remind us of our place in this great planet, this universe, that we are accountable to you. Bless us in this way and help us then as a people under your Lordship that we as a church might grow and thrive and draw others to this place so that they can learn more about our great God. In the name of Christ who died for us, who redeemed us, we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for your good attention today. Uh, if we can help any of you in your walk with the Lord, what a great way to begin a new year to be baptized into Christ. If you've not done that, you need to be thinking about baptism really seriously in the days and weeks to come. And we have a number of people here who would love to sit down and study with you if that's the case with you. And for those of us who are already Christians, um, what, what a great life it is to be uh, able to live under the Lordship of Jesus. Let's all sit down and sing.
fire. <laughs> 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 Yes, the skies are blue.
handiwork. We thank you for all that you've prayed upon this earth, Father. Your, your handiwork, your power is so amazing, Father. And we are so thankful that you have given us this earth to be stewards of. We pray that we will do all that we can to be good stewards and take care of what you have given to us. You have blessed us in so many ways, Father, beyond what we can even comprehend. First and foremost, for all the spiritual blessings we have for your son, Jesus. And then all the physical blessings earth that we enjoy of our, our health, our food, our clothing, our homes, and all of what you have put upon this earth. Father, help us to never take any blessings for granted. Help us that all blessings come from you. And without you, we are nothing, Father. Father, help us to always stand for the truth. Help us to always put you first in our lives and not let things of this world come before you. Father, it makes us so happy to see our young ones to want to have a zeal to sing and sing songs of praise unto you to glorify your name. Father, help us to do all we can to encourage them and to help them to learn and to, to develop them and to own them. And, to help them. and we know only through you will they mature as your children. Father, help each of us who are adults to grow each day in the study of your word. Help us to be constantly working and do the best we can to be obedient unto you, Father. And help us to do the best we can to help others in this world who are not obedient, who are not right with you, to come to know you, but through the study of your word and through encouraging them as well. Father, we, each of us, do sin and fall short of your glory. We each have specific sins that we do commit, and we ask you to forgive us of those sins, Father, and help us to overcome the temptation that leads to sin by studying your word daily and applying it in our lives. Father, we are so thankful for the lesson that was brought from your word this day by Terry. Help us to take this lesson, help us to apply it in our lives, help us to meditate upon it, and help us to share with others as we have, have, have opportunity, Father. Father, we are just so thankful for all that you do for us. Thank you for our country, the freedoms that we have, that we have, have um, all the freedoms that we do enjoy. We pray they will continue, Father, and we do ask you to the leaders of our country that they will turn and do what is right in your eyes. Father, I ask you to also be with all those men and women who are in the protective services and armed forces to watch over them, take them as only you can, and be put in time and pray that you'll bring them home safely. Be with us this day as we go to our homes, Father, and help us to, to have safe passage. And Father, we ask you that all of those who are away from us at this time to watch over them and take care of them as you can. We do ask you to be with Riley and Josh as they head back to college today. Be with them, watch over them, and guide them, help them to do your will, and take care as only you can. We are so thankful that you allow us to put them mercy this day. Father, thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you for answering our prayers. We love we praise you. We give you all the glory. We ask this prayer through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, you, you girls sound thank really you. good on this song. Oh, thank you. You did so good. You're like a professional, I swear. Are you going to do it again? Do it again and again and again. Does this have to start recording? Yeah, just close. It's only your second semester. Yeah.